Soccer fans throughout the D.C. region have plenty to cheer about this fall. With just a few weeks remaining in the season, D.C. United is sitting on top of its conference. But we didn't invite the team's managing general partner, Jason Levian, to the studio today to chat about the team's success on the field. He's here because the team is pushing a development project in Washington with the potential to affect taxpayers in the city. There's a deal on the table for the construction of a new soccer stadium in southwest Washington that would involve as much as $150 million in public funds. It also involves the city swapping one of the more valuable pieces of public property for the proposed site of the new stadium at Buzzard Point, land that's currently owned by a developer. There's little doubt that this deal is a good one for DC United, which has been eager to move out of the crumbling RFK Stadium for years. But the question is, is it a good one for the city? Jason Levian is the managing partner of DC United. He joins us in studio. Thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me, Kojo. You too can join the conversation. You can go to our website, kojoshow.org and watch our live video stream there. You can ask a question or make a comment there. You can also do so by calling 800-433-8850. Jason Levian, a D.C. Council hearing on this stadium proposal, turned into a pep rally of sorts this summer for the many team supporters who testified on behalf of the deal, under which the terms we described already. But we know pretty clearly how the team and its supporters would benefit from this proposal. Would you, would you say to those who feel it's less clear what the entire city, which would be invested in the deal, would get out of it? Well, thank you, Kojo. I think that uh, the first thing I would say is that our supporters, uh, you know, comprise the city and the surrounding communities, and they care passionately about soccer, passionately about D.C. United, uh, and also passionately about the district. Um, and I think that in, in looking for the proper site for a home for D.C. United, um, we were pretty extensive in our search. And wanting to be in the district was very important to us. And we feel as though Buzzard Point is a site that um, is really can help the district, can be a win-win for everyone involved. What would you say to people who feel that public money is not necessary to make this happen, over and above basic infrastructure costs? They'll say, you and your partners are not exactly poor people. I would say that uh, this is a deal that's very different than the Nationals ballpark deal. Um, it's much more in line with the Verizon Center. And, you know, having lived and worked very close to the Verizon Center in the mid-90s, um, I saw firsthand the impact that it had on that neighborhood, uh, the development that went around there, the jobs that were created, the economic opportunity that was created. And I look at Buzzard Point and I say, this can be another Verizon Center opportunity for the district. What kind of money will come back to the city long term? It's my understanding that the team will be exempt from property and sales taxes for five years after the stadium opens. There's a short runway of time where the, the, the district, uh, excuse me, DC United is paying for the vertical, paying for the stadium, covering overages above a certain point for the district, and there are some tax abatements for a few years uh, for the club. Uh, in a, once, once those end, in addition to paying taxes, uh, full sales taxes on the property, we're also going to be paying a $2 per ticket tax uh, above and beyond the sales tax so that we can reimburse the city for some of those uh, outlays. You've lived here before. You cut your teeth as a lawyer working for the firm Williams and Connolly here. You spend most of your time elsewhere these days, and the city's changed significantly since this was your full-time home. But to what degree do you still feel connected? to the people who live here in the neighborhoods like the ones like the one where you want to build the stadium? I feel deeply connected. You know, I, I walked in this building here today and I saw Diane Ream, who's a hero of mine, uh, and that, that gave me some goosebumps. Uh, so, and, and sitting here with you today, I, I feel the same way, um, having heard you on the air for so long. So I feel deeply connected to the city. It's, it's a, such a unique place, uh, you know, the nation's capital, and there's so many people from all over the world who come here. And to have a home for soccer, which is the world sport, uh, is something that I think is really important and, and can be an economic driver for us. Tell you what the thing I've been thinking of, and I don't know if I can explain it properly, but I'll try, is that a city's leaders always have to try to strike a balance between, on the one hand, making sure that the people who need them in the city have appropriate city services, and on the other hand, making sure that the city has the kind of dining and entertainment attractions that make it a city that people want to live in. What do you think, A, DC United does for the city in that regard, and B, what do you think a new stadium for DC United would do for the city in that regard? Well, I think a lot of it is about jobs and about economic opportunity in terms of that development, and uh, the return on the investment the district would be making in this deal 
uh, would be plentiful. Um, I would also mention that just in Ward 6, the, the sort of the programs that DC United is involved in uh, with the United Soccer Club has a location, for example, at Amidon Bowen Elementary School uh, in Ward 6 um, and United Reads program. So I, one of the things that I've noticed, Kojo, this is just our third year owning the team, but the amount of goodwill and uh, the, the investment that this uh, organization has made in the community uh, has really resonated. Let's go to the phones because I knew this question would come up pretty soon, so let's get to it now from Steve in Washington, D.C. Steve, you're on the air. Go ahead, please. Yeah, hi. Thanks very much. Um, I cannot wait for a new soccer stadium. I love watching continuous uh, soccer every uh, weekend, and uh, I love the new soccer stadiums uh, all through the country, soccer home stadium. But uh, the... Proposed location down at Buzzards Point. I went there once it was announced, and I don't think that's a really good location at all. I was wondering what uh, you folks thought about the location. And then I guess the second point is why not utilize uh, the land at RFK because uh, it's already owned by the government. It would be a lot less money uh, spent. Uh, and I'll take my uh, answer if I'm offline. Thank you very much. Thank you for your call, Steve. Steve, thanks so much uh, for the comment and the question. Um, first, about RFK, uh, it's on federal land, uh, so it would take an act of Congress uh, for us to redevelop that that stadium site. Um, and studies that we looked at when we first uh, came into ownership of DC United indicated that it would be actually more expensive uh, for us to go through that process. Uh, uh, secondly, there isn't that the economic development opportunity there because of the federal land issue and some of the issues surrounding the neighborhood. Uh, Buzzards Point, what we're excited about, Steve, is that it's on the other side of South Capitol Street. Uh, there really hasn't been the, the economic development that you've seen where the Nationals Park is um, on the east side of South Capitol Street, um, and we think it's ripe for that opportunity. So we're looking to, to make this a, really an entertainment district, a district that creates jobs, um, that, that it becomes an exciting destination for people, not just on nights when we have MLS games, uh, but other nights as well. What are the alternatives for DC United if this plan doesn't make it through the council? That's a great question, Kojo. I've been searching for those, for a plan B and a plan C. Um, and when we first came in, we tried to find what they were, and it was very clear that this was the right location at the right time uh, for the club and for the city. And so we've been focused on that. We, we don't have a plan B at this point. Uh, we're all in on, on making Buzzards Point work. Uh, making it work for district residents and making it work for this community. For those people who haven't been there, you can tell them what's wrong with staying at RFK Stadium. It's my understanding that the team has lost money every year at RFK. It has, and and more than that, Kojo. It's if you've been there, it, it wasn't built for soccer. Um, it, the the sight lines are very poor. Um, there's great history at RFK. I don't want to knock RFK because there is an excitement level just going into a building that hosted so many amazing contests, not just in soccer, but also in football and also in baseball uh, and great concerts. But it's outlived its useful life, for, certainly for, for DC United. Um, and there'll be a greater sense of intimacy uh, among participants and those attending the matches uh, when we're in a soccer-specific stadium. Is it your view that a new stadium will be enough to reverse the team's financial fortunes at RFK? I certainly hope so. <laughs> I can tell you that's, that's, a, that's important for us, but more important for us is being a great steward of, of, the, of the organization in this community. It, it, when we made this investment, you're right, Coach, I have a strong uh, emotional connection with the district. Um, we want to see this work. Uh, I, I grew up as a young professional when DC United was in its heyday, when it was just starting out winning championships. Uh, I went to matches at RFK then. I uh, was a big Ben Olsen fan back then when he was just starting out. And, and to be a part of it uh, and to be a part of this community and, and doing something that's really going to help people, we're, we're excited about that. Our guest is Jason Levian. He is the managing general partner of DC United. He joins us in studio. We're inviting your calls or comments at 800 Four three three eight eight five zero. You can send email to kojo at wamu.org. Do you support the idea of using some public money for the construction of a new soccer stadium in southwest Washington? Why or why not? 800-433-8850. You can also go to our website, kojoshow.org. Join the conversation there and watch the live video stream of our conversation. You can also shoot us a tweet 
at Kojo Show. A lot has been made of how a new stadium has revived the professional soccer franchise in Kansas City. Sporting Park was built with the help of $200 million in public funds. It opened in 2011. Now, the team there, Sporting Kansas City, has one of the most vibrant scenes in the entire league. What do you think are the most valuable lessons to be learned from what happened there? Uh, well, first, Kojo, in, in terms of the question that you asked people to call in on, uh, we don't support public funds going to the construction of a stadium for DC United. We, we support a public-private partnership uh, where the district is, is providing us the land, but DC United is constructing the stadium, um, and we're, okay. we're using our own dollars to do that. Okay. Uh, but you're right, Kansas City is a remarkable uh, turnaround and, and excitement level. Uh, what they've been able to do there um, is really incredible, and, and I would invite people to, to, to take a look at that because it's it, there's a passion and an excitement level among the fans that has really brought the city together. Now, they're our nemesis right now. We're battling them for first place in the Eastern Conference, and we've got a very big matchup um, this Saturday at 3 o'clock against Philadelphia, and then we host Kansas City uh, a little bit later. Uh, but and that being said, it's exciting to see what Kansas City's done in a market that no one thought had the same kind of potential that it's tapped into. And, and can you imagine if they can do something like that in Kansas City, Kojo, what we can do here in the district? I was about to say, how much of that model do you think is replicable here in D.C.? I think it's not just Kansas City. You look at Portland, we look at Seattle. Uh, there, there are a lot of markets, even Philadelphia. We look at markets around the country that have put in soccer-specific stadiums. Um, Seattle's using a football stadium because sure. it's so popular. Uh, but I think we can do great things. I think that it can connect our fan base and really grow our fan base. And this is the international game. And having more and more folks in the district get exposed to it uh, and be a follower of a local team, not just an e EPL team, uh, is something we want to see happen. What, is, what do you make of Seattle's success? What's the reason that they are playing in a football stadium yet seem to have gangbusters attendance at their game? They, they really tapped in to the heartbeat of that community. Um, and the sport is so exciting when people see the authentic nature of the game uh, that people around the world have been seeing for hundreds of years. Um, I think that that is really where, where you see that excitement level. And, and that's something we've studied because... Uh, we want to connect with the fans the way they've done it in Seattle, the way they've done it in Kansas City. And and don't get me wrong, DC United has had great success on the pitch and have, has a very vibrant fan base. Uh, but they're going to be even more energized uh, in a new home. This is particularly important coming from you. You grew up playing basketball, and you invested in a basketball franchise. You ran a basketball franchise. What drew you to soccer? I think that soccer and basketball have a lot of commonality in terms of they're the most democratic, little d democratic sports. Um, and it's so exciting. When, when I traveled around the world, um, my partners in, in DC United are from Indonesia. Um, and when I travel around the world and look at the game of basketball and look at the game of soccer, you see how, how mature soccer is, how excited people are about it. Yet here in the United States, it's really just starting to take off. And I think we saw that around the World Cup, Kojo, in June and July. Um, but I see a real connection between the two sports in terms of the teamwork, in terms of the democratic nature of them, and uh, it's exciting. We got an email from Josh who says, looking at MLS attendance figures, teams that play in soccer-specific stadiums typically boast significantly better attendance figures than teams that do not. Can you talk about your expectations regarding attendance figures going forward? My expectation is we're going to be in a new stadium, we're going to sell it out. That demand is going to exceed our supply. Um, we've studied that. Uh, we know the passion for soccer is here. Uh, we know the following for DC United is there. And if people are coming to RFK, Kojo, we rolled out games our first year owning the team in 2012 um, in a stadium that wasn't built for soccer, that was built in 1951, um, that uh, really didn't have uh, the modern nature of what's going on around the, around the country in terms of soccer-specific stadiums, we feel very confident that we're going to put a compelling product out there and that people are going to be there to watch. Got to take a short break, but when we come back, we'll be continuing our conversation with Jason Levian. Would a new stadium in D.C. make you more inclined to, end, to attend a D.C. United soccer match? What do you feel could improve the experience of seeing a game from what it is right now at RFK Stadium? Give us a call, 800 433-8850 or send email to kojo at wanu.org. You can watch our live video stream at our website, kojoshow.org, and join the conversation there. I'm Kojo Nan. <laughs> Go 
coming up with one domestic violence in the spotlight. A survivor tells her story. Plus, the return of debtors' prisons as more courts rely on fees and fines, the poorest are paying the price. The Dead One on the Kojo Nandi Show on WAMU, 88.5 and streaming at kojoshow.org. Welcome back. Our guest, our guest is Jason Levy, and he is the managing general partner of DC United. You can call us at 800-433-8850. How do you think the city could benefit from the construction of a new soccer stadium for DC United? Do you think these people, these benefits, would extend to people who are now not now currently soccer fans? 800-433-8850. You can talk about the experience of going to a new stadium. Stadium, what it means for you. The Nationals, Jason Levy, and play 81 home games a year. It's Park. Verizon Center hosts an event, it seems like, just about every night. What do you make of some concerns that all of this, this money is going into a facility that in the end may not get used that much? There are only so many events to go around to keep that place filled. That's something we've thought about and we've studied in other markets, Kojo. And, and one of the points I would make is that if you don't fall in love with the game, which is soccer, which I think you will, um, I will say that we're going to have other concerts and other events we're planning uh, in the new stadium. Uh, we want this to be a community center uh, for events, for, for different uh, opportunities for music, for live, live uh, events. And so that's something we're focused on, Kojo, in order. We're, we're motivated just like the district is, just like district residents are, to make it a destination more than just for Major League Soccer uh, events, and that's what we're planning to do. Here is Heidi in Bowie, Maryland. Heidi, you're on the air. Go ahead, please. Thank you. Uh, I just wanted to make a comment that uh, nobody has discussed yet is that RFK Stadium is falling apart. We've been a season ticket holder at DC United since the year 2000, um, and we will continue you know, to be season ticket holders as we move into a new stadium. But I just wanted to make the point that RFK is, is just um, lived just through its purpose. You know, the, the seats are broken, bathrooms don't work great. Um, it's just seen it better days, put it that way. You can't have enjoyment just based on tradition, right? Is what yeah, you're no, <laughs> no. I mean, you know, it's, it's been a wonderful venue. We've certainly enjoyed being there. But outside of the fact that, yes, it, it loses money, it's just not functional anymore. It wasn't built for soccer, and, well, it's getting old. Thank you. First of all, thank you, Heidi, for your support and your continued support. Um, some people come to our, our games with hard hats on. Uh, <laughs> there is some there is some falling concrete, but no, it's it's a very safe venue. But you're absolutely right; it has outlived its usefulness, especially for soccer. And we're so excited about the move to a new stadium, and and really honoring RFK Stadium as we finish up there the next couple of seasons. On now to Karen in Washington D.C. Karen, you're on the air. Go ahead, please. Hi. Yes, my name is Karen, and I'm a D.C. resident, and I'm very concerned about where my tax money goes. And I'm wanting to hear what the explanation is for um, literally giving away land at the Reeves Center so that multi-million dollar condominiums can be built. Why is this part of the soccer stadium deal? Well, allow me to tell you that before Jason Levian responds, the land at Buzzard Point is not owned by DC United. It's owned by a developer, Ackridge. And 
Mayor Gray has agreed to sell the Reef Center for $55.6 million right. in, in addition to a land swap. Well, so they're not right. giving so, it away, but well, it is less than the land it is, it is less than the land is assessed for. You are correct. Yeah, yes, it's far less than the land is assessed for. And why must we do that? I mean, the soccer stadium is supposed to make a profit. We're giving them five years with no taxes. Why does that have to be included? Jason Levy? Well, I think that's a very good question, and I'm glad you raised it. Uh, the Reef Center site is a site that was identified by the city and also by Ackridge as one of the potentials for a land swap. And this is not new, uh, just the district. Uh, you see these land swaps happen around the country where a city didn't want to pay cash uh, to buy the land where DC United is going to pay to develop it, uh, but instead wanted to swap out city land. And there was a sense among the city administration that the Reeves Center how, had outlived its usefulness, that it was put there at a very important time to establish a neighborhood and it had done its work. After that had happened, um, my understanding is there was uh, quite an extensive appraisal process to determine the value of the Reeves Center. Um, and once that appraisal was done, uh, there was an agreed upon price for it. Uh, that being said, what's come up in the, in our hearings, uh, and there have been hearings that have been chaired by members of the council, including uh, Councilwoman Bowser, uh, in different wards, and one of those hearings was actually at the Reef Center, and the discussion was around what can we do on the Reef Center site um, that is good for the neighborhood, that's going to benefit the neighborhood. And there has been discussion there about not just building multifamily homes, but also potentially office space so there's more daytime traffic uh, and also some affordable housing uh, initiative as well. So there's a lot of discussion going on. I'm not privy to all of it. Most of those discussions are happening between Ackridge, the developer, and members of the council who have to vote on this legislation. Karen, thank you very much for, for your call. We got a tweet from Jonathan O'Connell of the Washington Post who says, is Jason surprised that the Reef Center has become the most controversial aspect of this deal? I'm not surprised. I will tell you that uh, you know, our focus is on, certainly on Buzzard's point, uh, but as we spent the last uh, two years talking about the Reef Center as, as a part of the land swap, Jonathan, um, I will say that I understand why that building in that neighborhood uh, is so important to so many people. Um, and I understand that they need to work out a solution that is fair and equitable for the residents of the neighborhood, for the district, and certainly for Ackridge as well. I think they're working towards that in a very constructive way, and they're going to come to a resolution. On to Tony in Bethesda, Maryland. Tony, you're on the air. Go ahead, please. Uh, yeah, I, uh, first of all, I really enjoy your show, Kojo, and it's the first time I've ever called because I've been struck by the, the excitement that uh, casinos generate in, uh, in terms of uh, it'll be good for the city and whatnot. And my, uh, my comment is that uh, when you compare, at least in my view, um, uh, building a new soccer stadium, which is, a, I would say, basically a family-friendly and people-friendly uh, endeavor, it seems to be a lot better, uh, a, a lot better solution to uh, employment and development uh, than a casino. Uh, that's, that's, I guess, that's a comment, and uh, and I guess I, my question is, has has anybody else uh, brought this up, or is that too? Uh, Verging too much on morale. Well, most of the casino discussions we're having had to do with casinos being developed in Maryland and not in the District of Columbia. But I don't know. Jason might have another comment in terms of soccer being a healthier pastime than gambling. <laughs> I, I certainly think that's the case, um, and I, and I, I agree. I mean, we're building a community venue here, a venue that that you know, having lived in the district, I understand isn't always available for outdoor events and concerts during the summer, and spring, and fall months. Um, we're gonna we're gonna get people excited about soccer, about uh, kids getting to coming to games and bringing them to games to play the sport and to stay healthy and active. Uh, but certainly, we see this as more than just soccer. We see it as a venue uh, for other community events. We got an email from Pat who says, "Famos United. I'm a season ticket holder and member of the Barra Brava. One of the great things about RFK is that supporters have the best seating location in the league, midfield. Would a new stadium send supporters to the end zones?" We want them at midfield, Kojo. We've talked about this. We need our supporters. They carry us through tough moments and matches. Uh, certainly our players talk about how passionate and energetic our supporters are. We think we've got the best supporters in the league, and we need more of them. Uh, but we've got some great supporters groups. 
and we work closely with them, and they're going to have great seats at the new new stadium. Okay, so you won't be you won't be confined to seats uh, in the end zone. Um, could the Seattle Sounders model the combination football soccer stadium? Can that model you think work here in DC? You know, we, we've looked at it other places. Uh, we feel as though the best opportunity for us is a soccer-specific stadium that's going to be more intimate, uh, that's going to have great sight lines, uh, that's going to be really uh, something that spearheads even more excitement and growth for soccer in the district. So that's where our focus is, Kojo. But it's worked other places. They're also doing that in Atlanta. They're building a new uh, football stadium in Atlanta, and they're making it uh, work for MLS as well. Here is Will in College Park, Maryland. Will, you're on the air. Go ahead, please. Yeah, I'm wondering um, the design of the stadium itself, the construction of the stadium. I look at, at, you know, United States design seems to be, you know, the butts in the seats equal bucks. How many seats can we get in the stadium and, and make the money? Whereas I look at European and uh, designs of stadiums, and I see the way their aisles are built. Down near the front, they're very narrow, and then as they get towards the exit at the top, they're very wide, so that that Getting in and out of your seats, getting in and out of the stadium is not an inconvenience. You know, you're not standing in queues and waiting. I wonder what, what model you're going to go with there. Design elements, Jason. That's a, that's a very good question. It's something we've talked with our architects and engineers about. Um, I will tell you, soccer is unique because uh, there are no timeouts. Uh, so you got a halftime break, and you don't want to leave your seats other than that. So... You think about different stadiums when it comes to baseball and football, and there are a lot of time breaks for you to go, uh, you know, go to the restroom, get a bite to eat. You won't miss much. Uh, in soccer, you really can't leave your seat too often. So, uh, but you make a very good point. We want to make it very fan friendly. Certainly, we want to make sure that the economics make sense. Uh, but but it, they only make sense in the long term if our fans and our supporters are happy and comfortable. Soccer, as we learn to plan our bathroom breaks. Here we go to Greg. In Brightwood in D.C., Greg, you're on the air. Go ahead, please. Thanks, Kojo. Um, I'm a lifelong soccer fanatic. I referee. I just, I've been to friendlies at RFK Stadium. I've only been back in town the last four years. I've never been to a D.C. United game, and I can't tell you how excited I am at the prospect of seeing them and the development of the waterfront and Buzzard Point. I think they need to get the deal done. I hope the City will get behind them, but I'm ready to start going. I'll probably go to D.C. now and then, but uh, I really think it's needed. Thank you. Thank you very much for your call. Jason, when you say that the growth trajectory for Major League Soccer is unreal, do you mean that in terms of attendance, in terms of TV deals? I think there's great opportunity, Kojo. We're only in the 19th year of Major League Soccer. And as we enter the 20th year, two decades old, we're in, in the growth stage of the sport in the United States, certainly. You see that in terms of even the new national media rights deal that was done uh, for Major League Soccer. You see that in the excitement level uh, of English Premier League and other leagues around the world just here in the United States. Um, certainly attendance is one indicator of that. Uh, we've had seen a growth in attendance this year. Uh, we've seen a growth in our local ratings here. And, and as you know, Washington was the number one rated market for the World Cup in all of the United States. So, so not only do we see the growth nationally, but really in this market it's especially true. And Ishmael in Arlington, Virginia. Ishmael, you're, we, we have to have some point at some point get into the selection of your players. Here's Ishmael in Arlington, Virginia. Ishmael, you don't want to talk about the stadium, do you? No, I don't, Kojo. Tell, us what, you want to talk about. Tell us what you want to well, talk about. I have a question. So if you noticed around the country, there are a lot of um, teams now that are starting to get the European players. Now, what is BC United going to do to start attracting those big guys? We saw Ronaldinho, he left Europe, he went back to Brazil. Now he's in Mexico. Right? I'm thinking, you know, why couldn't DC United pay him to come here? Because that would all obviously, you know, make the game more enticing for the Americans that don't really like soccer and grow, you know, the attendance. Because I've been to a few DC United games and, you know, there are very few people there at most of them. But very, and I think we need to attract. There are very passionate people there. People in this country get very into the World Cup. That's once in four years. How do you tap into that kind of enthusiasm and channel it to MLS? Does that mean you have to bring players here with, who have wider, worldwide recognition? I think that's part of it. I think Ishmael makes a good point. Certainly, I will say that in 2012, we sold out the lower bowl of RFK over 20,000 when we were winning. So part of it is putting a winning product on the field. 
Uh, last year, we struggled at attendance uh, because we, we struggled on the pitch. And this year, certainly, we've seen a big rebound there. Uh, but we've brought in international players. Our, our MVP candidate this year is from Argentina, Fabian Spindola, who's had an unbelievable year um, and has really helped us. Certainly, uh, I will say we've got some local talent like Bill Hamid, uh, who's an outstanding goalkeeper, played in the All-Star game, has a real chance, we think, with the national team here in the United States. Um, our strategy this year, Ishmael, was to bring in players who are proven in MLS, um, who had shown they could win in this league. Uh, but in past years, we've also looked internationally, and we're going to continue to do so. Stephen Goff writing last week about two international Ghanaian players who never met one another, even though their families knew one another in Ghana. But I'm afraid that's all the time we have. Jason Levian is the managing general partner of DC United. Vamos United, thank you for joining us. Thanks so much, Kojo. And thank you all for listening. I'm Kojo Nandi.